Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with Shuko. How sustainable are you in practice? If at any point you have any difficulty viewing this webinar, then click on the chatbot bottom right of your screen and one of our support team will be along to help you. There's plenty of opportunity for Q&A, so if you'd like to submit a question, simply click on the button on your screen. Let's get started now with Shuko UK's Commercial Director, Sean Butler. Welcome to the latest in our series of AT Shuko webinars. In today's webinar, we'll look at the way we can improve sustainability in our own offices. You're about to hear from three experts on the issues they faced as they developed a sustainability approach in their own practice. This is an issue we take extremely seriously at Shuko. As a company, we have actively committed in reducing our CO2 footprint. For example, at our head office and our facilities in Germany, where over 50% of Shuko staff are employed, we've achieved a 60% reduction in our CO2 footprint in three years. We've also achieved a big reduction in business travel through the use of video conferencing technology long before the current pandemic forced the change. We operate in over 80 countries. Across our business, we attempt to utilize resources efficiently and cleanly to avoid climate damaging pollution. For instance, we bought a completely new fleet of low consumption lorries and invested in a new intelligent transport system to deliver efficient logistics and reduce empty trips to lower our environmental burden. We've also introduced parking spaces with charging stations for electric cars and bike leasing. We believe that Shuko is one of the sustainability pioneers within the construction industry, but I know we don't have all the answers. So uh, I'll be extremely interested to hear the presentations and discussions today. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. Um, I'll now pass you back to Chris, who's chairing today's presentation. Thanks very much, Sean. Hello, I'm Chris Voges, editor of Architecture Today magazine, and thanks for joining us uh, for this discussion on how sustainable are you in practice? Um, it's natural that uh, architects and engineers who are very involved in thinking deeply about how to reduce energy use and uh, carbon emissions in, uh, in the buildings of others uh, should also be interested in uh, how they might do that in their own activities uh, as energy using carbon emitting entities. Um, and uh, we will be considering some aspects of how they do that and why they do that um, in the discussion that follows. We are very pleased to be joined by three speakers whose roles in their uh, firms are both outward looking in terms of shaping strategies and approaches for uh, improving sustainability in the, in the project work they do, and also inward looking in, in terms of uh, addressing the, the energy use of the, uh, of the businesses in operation. And our speakers are uh, Maria Smith, who's uh, Director of Sustainability and Building Physics at uh, Bureau Happold. Maria uh, was originally an architect and subsequently uh, became also an engineer. Uh, and, uh, and has had a, a strong interest in sustainability throughout all of her work. Uh, Peter Fisher, who is um, Director and Head of Sustainability at Bennett's Associates, um, who also sits on the RIBA's uh, Sustainable Futures Group. Uh, and Anna Graf, who is uh, Director of Sustainability at White Architecture and is uh, joining us live from uh, Sweden, where she's based, but the office, the practice also has uh, offices in Norway and uh, London. And the format is that each uh, is going to say something about their own activities in this area. Uh, and that uh, after each has said something, there will be an opportunity for questions uh, to them uh, from from you, the audience. Um, and that uh, at the end uh, of all those three presentations, we will reconvene for a panel discussion where again uh, we can answer questions. So please do, as we go, put uh, any questions you have uh, in the chat box below the video player. Um, it's always a shame when we get to the end of uh, conversations and there's an avalanche of questions come in that sadly we don't get time to answer. So if there is anything uh, that arises out of the discussion you'd like to see uh, answered or explained in any more detail, please do uh, uh, pop it in the chat, chat box as we go. Uh, but without further ado, and to get us started, I will hand over to Peter. So, Peter. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, what I'm going to run through today is not um, so much about uh, projects per se that we've worked on, albeit we've worked on quite a lot of highly sustainable projects over the course of 30 years of practice. But I'm going to focus much more on us as a business, us as an organization, and our own impacts and what we're doing to try to capture what we're doing and to better what we're doing. Um, I think it's fair to say most of us uh, accept um, that there is a deep 
uh, issue around climate change in particular, and there is increasing societal, political, economic uh, pressure for change to take place. Um, and there are lots of uh, words and deeds and declarations um, and statements, but all of which are completely and utterly meaningless unless they translate into tangible and meaningful change. And that's one of the things that we've been concerned with for a number of years. Um, and a subject like sustainability, it can be um, a word salad of terms that, that are misleading, um, a lack definition. I personally have always struggled with the word sustainable or sustainability. Um, and numerous other ones have come into play. This subject was um, environmental design at one point, it became sustainability. It seems to be morphing into net zero carbon. It will probably change into um, something else fairly soon. But many of these words have very little meaning without tangible um, and often numeric targets associated with them. And that is something that we've tried to do through projects for uh, many, many years. And so in 2017, we decided to, um, to set 20 key sustainability targets for ourselves as a business um, that was effectively five-year plan. So 20 targets for 22. Um, and they were set in 2017. So we're just over halfway through these. The world has changed very rapidly during that time. And if anything, they're probably looking um, slightly conservative, some of them. But my intention today was just to run through the document that we produced three years ago, um, explain how we've gone about doing that, whether or not that constitutes ethical business or sustainable business is probably for others to determine rather than for us to state. But we are trying to be as clear and as targeted. And it's a relatively short document. And I'll update a little bit on our progress or our perception of our progress against that. Um, so back in 2017, there were, uh, there were quite a lot of things that we were doing. Um, we'd been using the Global Reporting Initiative as a way of uh, declaring our um, impact as a business for quite a few years. We were by then the first architects in the world to have approved science-based targets, which have become more and more significant. And I think this is something that we as a profession really do need to, um, to understand. Uh, we were also the first architectural practice in the world to commit to um, measuring, reducing and offsetting carbon emissions under the, uh, the UN's uh, Climate Neutral Now program. And, but then some of the targets on here begin to look quite conservative. Uh, 2050 to aspire to net zero is probably now not good enough. And this is all stuff that we are going through as a recurring process um, to try and improve on all of those. And obviously the last year has had quite a significant impact um, positively and negatively on environmental footprints. Um, so the purpose of the document, as said, was uh, 2017. It set out a five-year plan and it set um, 20 clear targets. And that many of them were based on a science-based uh, type trajectory. I don't expect everybody to read this page, obviously, but that's just the introduction to it. Um, and it was intended to bring clarity to us and to us as a business. And in a way, it was as this document is at least as important for us internally as it is for us externally. And it's about messaging um, and commitment internally to us as a business. Now, the way that it's set out is around the three key facets of our business, um, you know, the running the business, the designs that we do, and the people that we employ, our most important resource. And we set that out then into 20 clear targets, which I will slowly walk through and um, you know, show each one. I mean, some of the most obvious ones in a way are around energy use um, and trying to reduce energy intensity. Um, we have long purchased 100% um, renewable electricity. Um, that technically means a substantial portion of what we, of our operations have been uh, net zero carbon for quite some time, but we still feel it is incredibly important that we focus on energy intensity and don't sit back and um, simply state that we purchase renewable electricity. And also our gas is still uh, a fossil fuel based uh, fuel source. We're looking at the buildings at the moment. We've got studios in um, London, Edinburgh and Manchester. And we're, we're looking at the, um, the two that we have direct control over London and Edinburgh and how we can get to closer to net zero carbon um, energy intensity use on those. 
as well as continuing to procure um, clean energy. And then most of what we do, um, and this is increasingly so across projects, um, is taking the science-based uh, trajectory um, uh, approach. And we're applying that to ourselves as well as to projects. And this has become more and more significant as a project device as well. But I think understanding it as a business has been a very helpful driver for us. Um, broadly, the science-based target, for those that don't know, these, this is a, a graph showing uh, the potential warming of current policies, um, the baseline, and then the more optimistic ones. And the very bottom one at 1 1.5, which is the Paris Agreement, um, uh, shows the trajectory that we as a society need to be on. And ever so roughly that red line, the red uh, trajectory or curve, that's ever so roughly about 4.1, 4.2% year on year reductions in climate um, change gases. Now, it's important to state that that is simply the minimum that we need to do. So really, we individually need to be substantially below that. Simply hitting a science-based trajectory isn't really quite uh, good enough. But that's what we're basing um, much of our project work and our analysis of ourselves on. Now, us as a business, that's led to a lot of um, measurement is not as difficult as we thought um, to do. A lot of it lends on Mike Brennan Lee's uh, book, um, How Bad Are Bananas, which we use for uh, a lot of the, the key data behind that. You will see here, actually, it is dominated by two facets. It's the gas and the electricity that go into our um, buildings. Even though the electricity is um, a 100% renewable tariff, we think it's important to keep it on there. And the other is business travel. Um, and then on top of that, some of the significant things are the goods purchased, uh, things such as coffee. That's incredibly uh, significant. It's about five to eight percent of our total um, carbon emissions. So we're measuring all of this. Most of it is just done from receipts and it's more straightforward than you might think. But that enables us to, um, to have a baseline that we compare ourselves against. Um, this has also actually been very useful in understanding other service businesses and how significant their property portfolio is within that. Um, this then just sets out our absolute emissions against the old um, two degree warming um, science based target and the newer 1.5 and until um, the beginning of this year we were doing fairly well we were doing reasonably well on business travel that's got all gone out the window I mean business travel is virtually non non-existent at the moment and our building energy use is um, difficult to understand at the moment. It's all over the place. It's not heating, but there are still quite a lot of computer loads. So I think this year has, um, has thrown a lot of this out of, um, out of kilter a bit, and we need to understand that much better going forwards. Um, we do then offset all of our um, carbon emissions. I'm not a huge believer in offsetting as a default process. I think everything else has to be in, first, in place first and then and only then do you start offsetting. It can actually be a bit of a fig leaf if we're not careful, but that is through UN approved um, um, offsetting mechanisms that we do that. And uh, we do that through the whole office and are um, democratic in our selection of, of individual uh, projects. So we do know exactly which projects this is going into. Um, there are other things around um, industry action that's in particular are quite heavily involvement through the UK Green Building Council, the um, uh, London Energy Transformation Initiative and one or two other things and we think that's very important both as an educative process for ourselves as research but also sharing that knowledge around the industry. It's a key part of, uh, of um, our uh, reputation and our just our belief in as collectively producing a better built environment. Uh, plastic free is a commitment. We, don't, we still don't quite know how to go about this in its entirety, but our assumption is that there is, there is a groundswell of pressure behind um, a move away from single use plastic. And we have moved towards entirely um, uh, plastic free um, uh, uh, 3D printing um, and um, biodegradable sources. I mean, we're still not entirely sure exactly how biodegradable that is, but we are looking into that in some depth. Um, and I said, the knowledge sharing through things like Letty and the UK GBC are incredibly important to us. And then on projects, this, I mean, bearing in mind, this is already three years old, so it sort of predates much of the, um, the more recent uh, declarations, but it's around as defined that each project needs to have a particular facet to it that is ambitious environmentally, um, that we go around, around and approach briefing in a very particular set way to ensure that we are at least raising 
um, key environmental concerns with, with client bodies and that that is clear and is done consistently across the office. Um, and then moving on that we um, are committed to carrying out embodied carbon analysis of our own using EPDs on all projects uh, on the major um, components by um, 2022. Um, and that is a process that's underway now and that is beginning to accelerate quite significantly. Um, and then we're doing a lot more research on materials and on the analysis behind uh, materials. Um, and then on actual projects, this is something that has really gone, and we've been doing for quite some time, which is both tracking the data behind projects and carrying out post occupancy evaluation. So we're committed to doing a set number of projects each year um, through the soft landings framework and also the building use studies methodology. We're registered to do that ourselves. Um, but if we can get external funding, we do. But I think importantly, we see that as our own research as well. So we're not we're not hidebound by um, only being able to do this where there is external funding or finance through client bodies. Um, then moving on to our people, um, we carry out, and this is uh, it's voluntary and it's anonymous. But we do staff carbon footprints every year and have developed a, a spreadsheet for doing that. That is now used quite widely by um, other organisations within the Islington Sustainable Energy Partnership. But the intent behind that was, is there a way that we can help our own staff be uh, better citizens? Now, there's, there's a little part of me, sometimes a little uneasy about, in effect, businesses um, you know, almost poking their noses into individuals' Uh, private lives. But if there are things that we as a business can do that help our staff reduce their carbon emissions, that actually more than outweighs our, um, our impact as an organization, I mean, quite considerably outweighs our um, impact as an organization. So can we help people? Part of that is having people understand their own emissions, um, having a process that helps them uh, switch their, uh, their energy suppliers, and then through those individual carbon footprints, you'll see you know, the green elements within this are mostly transport, particularly flights. And it ranges enormously across the office. And interesting, the person on the extreme right, I do know who that is, um, but these are anonymous. She told me um, that isn't somebody who's particularly senior or particularly wealthy. There is usually a line between those. Um, I know where I am on that graph and I'm doing all right. But one of the key things is, is there anything that we can do that helps our staff fly less? Now, this has all been blown out of the water by the last year, obviously. But one of the things that we started looking at and um, implemented about this time last year was what are called low carbon travel days. So through that, people who take, uh, there's, there are a whole set of quite complex parameters behind it. But in, in, in outline, people who um, choose to travel by train rather than flying, um, over a, a set time or a set distance are then able to have two additional uh, days holiday each year to take in that into account. Now it's not terribly expensive for us to do that but it has a huge impact on our collective um, carbon footprints as individuals and an organisation and as said probably the, the, the impact of this will be greater than the impact of us reducing our uh, carbon emissions elsewhere as a business. So this has just got going. Um, it's now somewhat been overtaken by events. Um, and then one of the latter ones is actually something we're looking at now. I don't know how many people realize, but probably your biggest um, carbon impact, um, maybe after flights, is your pension. And the standard IRIBA pension uh, fund, which is the one that we currently use, invests in all of these organizations. Um, it's something that we've only just begun to understand in a bit more detail. So we're looking into how we can um, continue lobbying the RBA to try and change that, or perhaps move out of that into a more uh, ben environmentally benign uh, pension fund. And I think there are two reasons for doing that. One is the simple morality of not investing in organizations such as this and not financing um, climate change uh, and fossil fuel companies. But the other is actually stranded assets. Now, this is, a, this is actually something from the FT at the beginning of October. It's when Next Era, who are probably a company you've never heard of, um, they're a wind turbine owner from Florida. They overtook Exxon Mobil, Mobil in um, market capitalization. Exxon was once the, the largest company by value in the world, and it's now been overtaken by a regional um, 
wind turbine owners. So I think there's a risk of stranded assets in pension funds. So if you take one thing away from this talk, it's really have a look at your pension because it's your biggest impact and it's also potentially a great, great risk to you. Um, and then some of the final pieces are within our document are around uh, fair pay, community involvement, particularly the areas that we, um, where our own staff and our mental well-being, our physical well-being, and we're monitoring that in much more um, detail now. And we were beginning to get quite a, a detailed understanding across offices of what that might mean. Um, and that is helping us understand both well-being within the design of office buildings, but also how we may off, um, begin to approach the net zero carbon um, office spaces. And then very finally, the last um, couple are around opportunities for much less privileged people. I mean, our office in Islington is in an area that does have quite a lot of um, underprivileged as well as very wealthy people. And part of that is, is trying to ensure that we, um, we give as much opportunity or more opportunity to people from poorer backgrounds than we do simply um, you know, upper middle class friends of the business who might manage to do work experience. So we're quite involved with local schools in trying to get those kind of people in into um, into our industry. And then that was the, that's a run through the document. I said it was done th uh, three years ago. It's got two years left to run, but the world is changing quite considerably and quite quickly. So there are some of those, we're making progress against some of them, we're making less progress against others, and we will continue to update this. But that's broadly how we're going about trying to capture and target being um, a slightly more uh, environmentally and socially benign organization. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, there's a huge amount there. Very, very interesting. Um, I, I'll pick up on a, a couple of the things um, that you talked about now. And uh, and I, again, I uh, reiterate that uh, if people want to anything um, uh, elaborated on further, please do post um, questions in the chat box below. Uh, but but uh, first off, I just wondered whether um, you mentioned that uh, coffee was a, an area that you were surprised to find was responsible for a, um, a disproportionate uh, or, or a surprising amount of uh, uh, of your uh, uh, your carbon load. Um, were there any other things that you were surprised at when you actually kind of measured your own activity in terms of what you had assumed uh, your uh, your pattern of behaviour or your operations would produce? Uh, and are there any areas that your your researchers suggest to you that others might be sort of unwittingly underperforming in? Um. No, I think really the, the big elements were probably as expected, and they were electricity consumption and business travel. Um, I think in projects, as we've got into it, understanding increasingly what the um, portion of the electricity is on um, IT and IT infrastructure is quite significant. We think that's in many buildings, that's 25 to 30% of the electricity use is in centralized servers and the infrastructure behind IT. So there is an argument for moving, an environmental argument for moving to cloud computing. It probably halves the carbon footprint um, simply through much more efficient um, use of, uh, of, of IT. I think on the smaller things, um, you know, coffee was much more than we expected. I think the use of milk was, um, dairy products was, uh, was less than we thought. I thought that you know, having vegan milk would be the solution, whereas it turns out it's actually just not having the coffee in the first place that's really the solution. Um, I guess that's quite difficult to go, a, a difficult road to go down. I, an interesting thing to come out of that, actually, which I'm uncomfortable with, is it's probably better to have Nespresso capsules than it is to have espressos, because the key factor is the coffee that goes into it rather than the aluminium of the, um, um, of the capsule. Um, I still can't quite bring myself to... Um, to do that though. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting when you get into that, it's because they have less coffee in them, um, but it's quite interesting when you get into that sort of granular detail of stuff, it can throw up surprising stuff. But I think the big picture is basically, it's um, energy going into the building and business travel. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, obviously in your in your uh, talk there that you that sharing information was important to you with others, and you talked about um, some of the some of the sort of local organisations with whom you share and, and other uh, 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 other places that you publish your findings about about yourself. Um, and you also talked about um, uh, that you sort of, as it were, uh, do do certain kinds of um, post documentary evaluation work and so on as as part of your own R and D. Is there ever a tension between sort of, as it were, your your um, 
your R&D, which in many industries would lead to kind of proprietary knowledge and the urge to share that comes with wanting to improve performance across the across the piece? Um, mm, like a good question. Uh, I think our, our attitude to that is we, we learn more from sharing than that we give away. Um, more morally, we, we need collectively to do better. And we're not going to do collectively as well if all of us hold our cards too close to our chest. Um, so I think our, our view on that is really it's just what it is what we need to do. And we will probably all learn more by, uh, by sharing it. Um, so I'd, we've never really had that debate in our in our, in our own office about whether or not it's um, there's a risk to us sharing data or not. I think there's there's much more benefit to it than there is disbenefit. And uh, questions uh, starting to come in thick and fast from the audience, which is uh, which is great to see. I wonder if uh, because we uh, we uh, we're against Scott a bit, but, but I wonder if you could deal in rapid fire with a couple of these. First, uh, someone asked, uh, do, "Does cloud-based?" Uh, uh, systems just push the problem to someone else to deal with. So I guess that's a question of where, where you know, where do you just push it into a uh, you know into, into a server farm with huge cooling loads if you move it out of your office building? Um, no, it pushes a problem elsewhere, but it also reduces the problem significantly. The impact of cloud computing, uh, most research shows, is at least half having that IT provision inefficiently provided within office buildings. So it is environmentally, in carbon footprint terms, much better to have. Uh, servers in the cloud than it is to have them in buildings. Uh, and uh, another questioner asks uh, if you could say just a bit more about um, how your uh, uh, low carbon travel uh, rewarded with um, extra days holiday works. Um, the uh, in principle, it's quite simple. If you uh, if you decide, as the example shows, to um, to go on holiday to uh, to Berlin. Um, it's over a certain number of hours if there's more than a four or five hour difference between a flight and uh, taking the train then you get an additional day for doing so and it's a maximum of two additional days um, per year uh, per person um, and we thought that the uptake from um, evidence was probably about 10 percent of people doing it which actually doesn't amount to a great deal of money um, over the course of the year and over the course of the business and, yeah. well Thank you for that. Um, we we uh, have a lot more questions coming in, but we will come back to those uh, as we get into the panel discussion, because now we move on uh, to our next speaker, which is Anna. So thank you. So thank you for inviting me here. I'll start with uh, just a short background about White. Um, we were actually founded already in 1951 in Gothenburg by a young architect called Sidney White. So they're for the name. We have offices mainly in Sweden, but also in Oslo and since a few years also in London, but we work all across Europe and as well as in Canada and in East Africa, mostly in Kenya. What is a bit particular is that we are an employee owned uh, company. So, um, and we are about uh, 750, 800 employees and among those uh, about 600 are shareholders. And I think this is pretty important for the culture of the company because uh, when you own yourself, I think it creates a sense of responsibility and you know also that what you invest in time, you will get back in that we can invest our profit in the company and also in our employees. Uh, the core aim of our business is that we, we want to, we believe that architecture uh, can drive the transition towards sustainable way of life. And with that, we mean uh, both creating social sustainability for people, uh, health and well-being, and also to keep the developments within the planetary boundaries. We have a pretty ambitious uh, vision that by 2030, all our architecture will be climate neutral through design excellence. And I'll come back to how we will try to solve that. Uh, we have many uh, disciplines within uh, the company and we work uh, in a wide range of um, projects and we also try to create uh, dis interdisciplinary teams. And since uh, many years we have also sustainability experts within the company. Um, already in the end of 90s we employed environmental specialists, then later social sustainability and also 
uh, expert in economic sustainability. And today we are around 40, 50 sustainability specialists. Um, I suppose like most of you, we also have those guiding principles, like we are certified according to 14,000, 14,001, and we are committed to the Global Compact 10 principles. We have a code of conduct for corporate sustainability. And every year we also report our sustainability work in uh, a sustainability report. We have also our business plan is new for 2020. So the targets we've set up for 2023 are, um, some of them are that 30% of our projects will be carbon neutral. All projects will have a climate declaration. Uh, we will do a 100% uh, circular project and we want to reduce our carbon emissions by 30%. Um, also since five years, we have, uh, we all of us have um, um, the sustainable development goals that also influence uh, our projects and the way we work as a company. And these are the seven ones that we have prioritized because these are the ones I think that we can uh, work with every day in our projects and that we can also influence um, uh, in larger amounts in a project. Um, to ensure that our projects are um, have a high sustainability profile, we always start in a project with uh, a sustainability analysis. And uh, the, this is um, um, starting out of, um, of the sustainable development goals, but there are also other aspects included in that. And then also since a few years ago, uh, I um, also measure the improvements we do in our projects. And as you see, focus uh, of our projects are uh, within the sustainable cities and communities, which isn't that strange because that is very much about architecture. But we also have a lot of high focus on good health and well-being. And just some of the figures that you can see that 90% of our projects have timber structure. And that is, we notice an increase in timber construction the last few years, and it's going pretty quick now. 39% uh, of our projects uh, are, uh, will be certified as according to BREEAM, LEED, or um, the Swedish system as we have. Uh, and 47% of our projects exceed the Swedish energy regulations, which is already pretty high. So that's very good result. I'll give you some examples of how we can work with uh, or um, implementing the sustainable development goals in our projects. Um, for instance, um, working with climate um, and um, decrease the climate impact of our projects, uh, a high amount of um, the climate impact today uh, comes from the building materials. So by working with timber structures, you can actually decrease the carbon emissions pretty much. And this climate innovation district is in Leeds um, and it has also renewable energy and some other measures that uh, makes it um, a low carbon development. Another low carbon project is this uh, quite spectacular building a culture center in Skellefteå, north of Sweden, uh, which will be one of the tallest um, timber structure buildings in the world when it's finished next year. Um, and we are also working with circularity. And this is an example where we have, uh, which is also one of the largest reuse projects in Sweden where 92% of the furnitures are reused. And it was also ended up that it was 70% cheaper than uh, instead of buying new furnitures. It's not just old furnitures. There, are, has, there have also been um, a redesign of some furnitures. But this project shows that circularity is um, really in um, focus at the moment because it has been nominated for best interior design both in Sweden and internationally. So very... Um, yeah, very exciting project to work with. Um, to create health, uh, good health and well-being could be made in many different ways, and uh, the architecture is really important for that. This is an example where the client wanted to to really focused on health and well-being, and they wanted uh, the employees to move around a bit more. So we created um, these stairs within the office, and uh, it has actually. Uh, 
uh, been a good result because people move around much more and they've had these step calculators. So they have a result of that. And also this uh, timber uh, creates a warm and human environment and uh, which is also very nice. There's also a lot of daylight in this building. Another way of working with um, health is uh, that we are strong within um, healthcare uh, architecture and uh, especially important in, uh, in this, um, in psychiatric, uh, this is an example from the psychiatric clinic in Nuuk in Greenland, um, that we have, we have also made research for many years that by um, good architecture and also linking uh, the architecture with nature, you can actually reduce um, um, medicines you need uh, or uh, the day you need to spend um, in the hospital. So there are great effects that you can uh, or benefits within healthcare that you that architecture can um, um, yeah support. Um, finally, also very important is to try to implement ecosystem services in the cities, because this is not only creating good environment for biological diversity; it's always also a way of handling the changes of climate, like inundations and um, raised water levels, um, but it also creates these very nice spaces for people to meet and it's good for uh, health and well-being. And it is also an economic question because it creates values for the real estate owners um, close to this and it's also uh, handling the risks of um, climate change. So what I also think is, uh, how can we actually push uh, the sustainability agenda even further? Then I think our white research lab has an important role. Um, this is um, our new research and development program, which is focusing on circular architecture and healthy living environments the following few years. And a few examples of uh, projects that has actually started as uh, smaller research projects or actually smaller studies within the projects was this is called Places for Girls. There were two architects, they wanted to studied, study how the public places were used because there was a, another study that showed that um, young boys uh, made up 80% of the uses uh, of shared spaces. So this is actually a way of um, uh, they want to study how to do uh, the places more equ equitable. So what they did, uh, this is very much about process, including people in the, the design process. So they had workshops with young uh, women and um, to find out how to design a, an urban place to make it more welcoming for everyone. We have also made this in London a few years ago. And it has actually been presented all over the world. And the architects behind this was also awarded um, the Swedish Architects um, Award for Equality. Another um, um, uh, method we've uh, developed is uh, this one um, for circular architecture, how we can actually work with circularity or reuse in a project. And this is also a tool for the recapture tool, which you can you can scan buildings to identify what you can actually reuse in an existing building. And this recapture tool was actually presented in the NLA's um, zero carbon report just a few weeks ago. We have also um, uh, uh, yeah worked with a me methodology for zero carbon buildings, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's also important for us as a company to, um, I think, to, to live as we learn and to, we have the possibility to also influence and, uh, our employees and be a role model for other companies. So what we do every year is to, to uh, measure our environmental and climate impact. And this is made uh, via a greenhouse gas protocol. And as you see, we have uh, reduced our carbon emissions with 66% since uh, 2014. And between 2018 and 2019, it was lowered uh, by 
And uh, I've also looked at how can we actually reach the 1.5 degree target and to be able to reach that in uh, 2030, we need to half the emissions that we had for in 2018. So we are actually, um, ha there are great possibilities to be able to reach that. So it's um, very nice. This is the distributions of the dif uh, different CO2 emissions. And as you see here, uh, our business travels and also the study tours have the highest uh, climate impact. Um, and, but we do have um, travel policy since many years, and that's the train should always be the first choice. And um, I'm pretty proud to say that 95% um, of our travels within Sweden are made by train. And this equals 65 turns around the globe. And also the, the Swedish uh, train company um, has awarded us for being this good traveling uh, by train. But this is within Sweden. So now we are pushing ourselves a bit further. So for 2023, we want to try to reach that 50% of our travels within Europe will be made by train. This year, there hasn't been many travels, but hopefully the following years will be more. Uh, the study tours was a bit of a, not problem, but we needed to do something about that. Historically, we did travel, we traveled to New York, Shanghai, or, or all around Europe. But um, instead of taking them away uh, completely, we uh, introduced a sort of climate budget for, for our employees. So during a period of three years, you can actually do one uh, round trip by flight. Um, but the, the other two years, then you need to take the train or the bus for the study tours that we are offering. And uh, it was uh, last year, it was um, a remarkable result because we decreased the carbon emissions from our study tours by 81%. And um, yeah, very successful actually. But we also do other um, um, measures to, um, uh, yeah, to. Uh, encourage or to um, uh, inspire our employees for more sustainable mobility. Like we have bikes within the offices and we offer also cards for bike sharing um, systems. We offer bike service every year for our employees twice a year. Uh, very, very popular. And uh, some of our offices ha have been um, awarded bike friendly office of the year. Uh, food is another uh, aspect that actually uh, we have high climate impact um, or a lot of carbon emissions from the food we serve, which is maybe a bit astonishing. Uh, and we decided, I think it was about eight years ago, to only serve vegetarian or vegan food for sort of lunches or client events or parties. And uh, we are almost there. It's 98% last year. Um, and this is also an example. It seem, might seem um, small and not that important uh, issue, but uh, actually you can influence the companies all around you or the, the, the restaurants that deliver food for you. We asked, for instance, during a party for a vegetarian buffet or actually vegetarian lunch and also three course dinner for 800 people. And that restaurant was sort of Oh, they didn't know how to solve that. But this was seven years ago, and now they are also offering uh, vegetarian buffets after that because they, need, they understood that they actually need to change their way of behaving. And we also, it's important for the health and well being for our employees. So we offer um, running courses and we have running teams during lunch times, or uh, our employees can have um, training cards. There are yoga courses during lunchtime and different types of inspirational lectures, for instance, food or so on. And this is a picture from our rooftop on our, our office in Stockholm. OK, but I'll wrap up with uh, how we will move uh, our sustainability agenda forward. And uh, now before Christmas, I will launch our roadmap for a climate neutral future. So um, there will be what we need to focus on to move even further um, and uh, what investments we actually need to do um, within the company to be able to deliver uh, even better projects. So um, thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Anna. There's uh, again a lot, uh, a lot in there to get to, and uh, I think some of those things we will definitely come back to in the panel discussion at the end, particularly perhaps um, the extent to which uh, a, a, an office might try to encourage uh, different kinds of private behaviour in it, uh, in its staff in their own uh, lives outside work, uh, and whether there's been any pushback on on some of the things that you've uh, that you've uh, pioneered there. Uh, but there are uh, questions coming in on what you've talked about. One, one set of questions uh, are possibly slightly off topic in the sense of uh, the specific theme of how sustainable are you in practice, but there are four of them uh, on the subject of timber structure. So maybe that's something that you could address. Three ask um, about fire regulations and timber structures in Sweden. I think this is a sort of subject of concern, certainly in the UK at the moment, whether, whether I suppose you think those are um, sufficiently rigorous and whether you find it um, relatively easy to do things like tall buildings and remain compliant. So that's that's the the, the, uh, the fire question. And there's also a question on uh, where you source your timber, whether it's local and whether um, how, how significant the transport, uh, the carbon implications of transport are and whether that uh, whether you think that might um, uh, be uh, be a different picture in the UK. Well, the fire regulations, uh, they were actually changed in uh, 1994. Before that, we couldn't build any timber constructions higher than two floors. Uh, so during now almost 30 years, there has been developing uh, new regulations. So, well, in some parts you need, of course, to um, fulfill um, certain uh, criteria, uh, and you can solve that in different ways. But um, no, it's not a problem to build uh, high-rise buildings at the moment you can solve that uh, not that difficult to do but I know that we have it's not that easy for us to suggest that in uh, England um, which we found of course a pity. Uh, we have one uh, one which is asking about uh, the tall building whether that's CLT and how tall is it uh, across laminated timber and the other question was whether the, your, the timber you primarily use is locally sourced and, and yeah. how how, uh, how that works in terms of the carbon implications of your projects. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, we try to not only locally source, but I can give you a comparison. We did um, here in Gothenburg a project and we calculated the carbon emissions, but they couldn't deliver it on time. So that manufacturer, actually they turned to their uh, uh, subcontractor or uh, they wanted it to be delivered from Austria but then not only the transportation but also the manufacturing they used other types of uh, energy not renewable energy so the climate impact of that timber structure was completely completely different so the benefits of that timber construction wasn't that um, much compared to concrete that it should have been if we had used um, locally sourced timber so there is a Quite significant difference where from where the timber comes so um, yeah uh, can, I, can I ask questions sort of relate following on from that one of the things you said early on in your talk was about um wanting to be um uh, by 2023 30 percent of, of your projects be net zero carbon uh, and obviously you can sort of advocate for that and push for that but where some things fall outside your control or, or people can be um uh, uh, re reluctant for whatever reason to kind of uh, follow the path that you want. Could you envisage a circumstance in which you have to say to people, "I'm sorry, we just can't work with you because we have targets that we're aiming to meet," or, or, or you know, d pragmatically, do you have to remain a bit flexible about that? Yeah, I can say that uh, already for 2019, we had the target to reach um, 30 uh, zero carbon projects, and then we include both uh, the operational energy and uh, the building materials. Uh, we didn't reach that because it's still a uh, quite high learning process in Sweden about this. Actually, the, a national target for that hasn't been, or a methodology for that hasn't been set since a few weeks ago. So now there is a certification system. So it is really a learning process. But by setting this target, the, the awareness within our office and within our company, now we know how to do that. And now we can start to push our clients forward. Um, and we can help them bring uh, these uh, types of buildings or projects forward. So I think it's starting to move pretty quick now, but um, we haven't said no to any projects yet, because it's also important to learn our clients to, how to do that. But maybe in a few years, I suppose maybe we will do that, but not yet, actually. And uh, another questioner is asking just if you could say a little bit more about uh, how the recapture tool works that you mentioned. 
uh, it's not my speciality, but uh, you do actually uh, scan the building and then the scanning is transferred to the Revit model and then you get the information into your Revit model and then it's you can actually work uh, at your desk uh, in uh, identifying what type of uh, uh, materials can you reuse or uh, especially also the, um, the the amount of different types of um, um, uh, materials so it's an efficient way of uh, identifying the materials within your building and it's also a way of um, yeah creating good drawings or models uh, for the real estate owners thank you and we, we... Show that another time if you want to. <laughs> yeah i think we're gonna have to return to a lot of these topics because the questions are coming in thick and fast as well um yeah. and uh, we'll we'll pick up on some of those when we get to the panel discussion uh later on but uh, first we're going to hear from maria so thank you anna and over to maria Okay, thank you for having me. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Bureau Happold and our carbon footprint and the work that we're doing to try to reduce it. Um, so firstly, in 2019, we um, released our first global sustainability report. And as part of that report, we made a number of commitments and targets. Um, these include being net zero carbon for our own business operations by April 2021, fast approaching. Um, to be net zero carbon in operation for all of our new build projects by 2030 and for all of our projects, new build and refurbishment to be net zero carbon in operation by 2050. Um, we're also thinking about embodied carbon, of course, and we're integrating embodied carbon assessments into our standard design and decision making processes and making sure that all of our material specifications reflect the latest thinking in reducing embodied carbon. So this was just over a year ago, and since then we've been working really hard to try and sort of yeah, meet this first sort of April 2021 goal, and then also set ourselves up for meeting the 2030 and ultimately 2050 targets as well. So one of the first sort of important things then was to start really trying to measure our own carbon footprints. And we've used this um, protocol that I expect many of you are familiar with, but in terms of sort of looking at the difference between scope one, so our direct emissions, scope two, our indirect emissions via the kind of energy and so on that we purchase, and then our scope three, other indirect emissions um, that can vary sort of very, very widely depending on our particular business operations. Um, so looking at our current footprint, so the first year that we measured was the 2018 to 19 footprint, and this worked out at about 3.1 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per person. Um, and as you can see, the, the majority, or so just over half of that was scope three, so this is through business travel. Um, and then we measured it again in 2019 and 20, um, and it's not gone up, it's just that we managed to include a little bit more um, in terms of our um, other scope three emissions, so especially IT equipment, the embodied carbon of IT equipment and things like that. So that did mean that we were sort of creeping up to 3.3 tonnes. But um, yeah, as I say, this isn't a an increase overall. This is just a kind of a slightly more accurate figure. And honestly, one of the things that has been most challenging about going through this process is trying to get these numbers right and deciding that sort of figuring out the, the, the right level of effort into getting these figures right. And at what point do you think, right, that's close enough. Now let's really focus on trying to reduce these figures rather than sort of getting kind of, you know, really, 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 really accurate um, results. Um, but again, still the, the business travel was, was a huge, huge chunk of our footprint. So from this, we made a reduction strategy. Um, and they've got, we've got a kind of five step approach to reducing our operational emissions to net zero. So the first point is to commit to science based targets. The second is to set a business travel annual carbon budget starting 2020 to 2021, reflecting the fact that our business travel was the, the largest part of our carbon footprint. Um, the third point is to increase um, home-based working, so reducing commuter travel, and this has obviously become much more important um, in light of the pandemic. Um, we're looking to reduce the um, office energy use and decarbonize all of our offices by 2025. Um, and also we're starting to look at introducing an incentive or allowance scheme for reducing our personal carbon footprints for 2021-2022. This sort of reflects also the um, uh, the fact that many, many of us are now working from home and will probably continue to work from home sort of a decent amount of the time. 
So just to dig into those into a little bit more detail. Um, so science-based targets are really, really important because they provide this globally recognized independent verification. Um, there's yeah, com currently about 930 companies taking part in this. Um, and they're around, um, what's really important about science-based targets is it's making sure that we're not sort of making arbitrary decisions, but actually trying to make sure that our commitments are allowing us to um, meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So to limit global warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing a element efforts, sorry, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. They're set over a five year period and they don't include offsets. They have to be absolute reductions. Um, so for our, um, our sort of trajectory going forward, we're using the 2019-20 as a base year. So that was the, the one that included um, slightly more scope three. Um, however, we benchmark that against a number of other offices and we feel that it's pretty good already, but nevertheless, we could absolutely do more. So we're looking at a 12.5% reduction over five years for our scope one and two, and a 21% reduction for our scope three. So that includes that business and commuter travel, um, again, over five years. So for example, the 21% reduction over five years, that um, equates to about 4.5% reduction, reduction year on year. So that's sort of, it's, it's achievable, but it will require a, a significant change in behavior over time. So these are the targets that we've, committed to um, and now we're looking at making creating budgets so that we can make sure that we do that and sort of em, um, embody this in our decision making and when we're deciding you know whether or not we are are we going to have this meeting or are we going to sort of be able to use more sort of uh, zooms and so on um, so we're setting our business travel um, annual budgets um, from the next uh, financial year um, to seek to to dramatically reduce that. And obviously in light of the pandemic, this is easier, but we also want to make sure that we're resisting a kind of urge to jump back too quickly um, to, to previous levels. Um, but at the same time, there will be a drive to sort of reconnect with people. I think we're all feeling like we wanna be in the same room with people. So it's sort of, it's balancing that, but also, you know, taking into account, for example, what, what kind of um, transport methods are we using? Is it possible to get the train rather than getting flights and so on as well? Um, so, uh, yeah, just making sure that we're taking advantage of the change in behaviour that has come out of um, COVID, but also making sure that we can reconnect with each other. Um, so then re increasing our sort of home base working, so reducing commuter travel. Commuter travel was also one of the key um, factors in our carbon footprint. Um, and our plan is to increase home working so that, I mean, we're thinking, you know, maybe that around 40% of our full-time working hours are going to be from home in the future. And this is sort of still all being defined and we're doing a lot of consultation with our staff at the moment, thinking, you know, how much do people want to continue to work from home? How many days a week? How much is that kind of allowing people to have a better work-life balance and um, thinking about mental health considerations and all that. So this is sort of up in the air, but um, if we are going to reduce um, the amount of commuter travel, then that's obviously going to be really, really helpful. Um, and this will reduce the energy consumption in offices, but also it's likely that energy consumption within people's homes will then increase to compensate. And so we need to think about how that balances against the savings we make in, in commuter travel. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, so we want to think about what kind of incentives or um, other kind of support and allowances we can maybe um, help to support uh, staff working from home um, to reduce our carbon emissions in those locations as well. Then for those of us in the office or when we are in the office, we need to make sure that we are reducing our office energy use and decarbonizing our offices. Um, so you know, things like um, where we're getting our energy from, preferably through power purchase agreements, um, reducing the actual energy demand. So sort of things like LED lighting and, and over the uh, lockdown previous earlier in the year, we had um, installed some upgrades to our systems within our London offices, sort of MBHR and so on. So reducing the energy demand of our offices and have used that period to kind of uh, take advantage of that opportunity um, and yeah considering extensive and effective sub metering to, to keep that consumption as as low as possible um, and of course finding sources for renewable energy wherever we can and um, for example we're looking at heat pumps in Bath um, using the River Avon um, and different kind of options and you know as an international practice there are opportunities and challenges 
um, that vary from office to office, um, but we are investigating all of these situations. Um, and then finally, this yeah, this point about sort of having some sort of incentive or allowance scheme for people allowing people to reduce their own personal carbon footprint. And this is a slide from the New Civil Engineer looking at sort of different options for where we can um, help our staff. You know, I've, I've personally tried to commit to reducing my own carbon footprint um, as much as possible and then um, offsetting the difference. And that's included um, not flying for a really long time um, and uh, yeah, changing my, my diet and so on. And, you know, I, I do personally understand how that can be sometimes challenging and sometimes it's actually relatively easy. Um, but so we're, we're talking at the moment within the office about what the, the sort of the best ways that we can do that and the best ways that we as an office can support people um, in, their own, um, in their own changes as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. So this is just a, a summary of the main reductions that we're looking to achieve over the next um, five year period. Um, and yeah, we absolutely will commit to sort of declaring our progress um, along, along the way. Um, I think it's really, really important that we don't just kind of set targets and then you know, forget about them. It's really important that we measure that sometimes things are gonna be different. I mean, one thing we've certainly learned from this year is that you know, this year is not the year that we planned when we sort of set out those um, targets at the end of 2019, but we're nevertheless, we're working on it and we're gonna be making a declaration um, further commitments and a declaration on our progress probably in the middle of next year as well after the end of our financial year and um, to see where we are at um, but yeah um, and the final thing I wanted to mention was around embodied carbon um, so the embodied carbon of our projects that is because that's obviously another really really key area in terms of our agency to reduce our carbon footprints um, the, at the moment the, the key thing that we're focusing on is integrating embodied carbon assessments and in um, as alongside, you know, as part of the construction declares, engineers declare um, declaration points, integrating that into our standard scope of work as much as possible um, and measuring that. So we're using sort of various tools through sort of simple Excel um, through to sort of Revit interface. And we have um, some really fantastic tools as well for um, through our um, BOM. Um, so that's our, our buildings and habitats uh, operational model um we got that wrong <laughs> um but yeah but these these tools that allow us to measure our embodied carbon and integrate that into the decision making that we're doing um across the board um and we've published some good guides as well that are available in the structural engineer about the kind of 10 key things that we can do in order to reduce um our embodied carbon especially as structural engineers where a lot of the embodied carbon lies um so yeah thanks very much and um, happy to take any questions Um, please do keep your questions coming in, and we'll be uh, we'll be convening again uh, uh, the, as a panel in uh, in a few minutes to to answer those. But the questions coming in off the back of that talk, Maria, are about um, well all sorts of things, homeworking, travel, and so on. But let's take travel first. Um, one questioner is saying, you know, do you envisage that there might be a system, a situation where you um, where you move more to uh, using a sort of buddy system. I know that Bureau Happold has about 25 offices around the world, so you're already quite distributed, but might you, you also working globally, so might you look to do more kind of sort of buddy pairing with other offices to avoid people having to come uh, back and forward? And uh, another question on the subject of travel is asking whether whether it might be, you know, the sort of more junior staff who do less travel and directors continuing to travel as normal, which I guess to, to put a different way would be, how would how do you imagine uh, the importance of different individuals traveling to for meetings uh, will be will be assessed what what sorts of meetings will be will require someone to physically to be present and which which sorts will be uh, ones that can be done in other ways from now on hi everyone yeah i mean we we do we have offices all over the place at the moment but we still do find that sort of working with partners buddies um is is a really really important part you know i'm working at the moment on um projects in in toronto and in beijing for example where we're sort of collaborating with local partners and that really is it's just a very important part of our approach anyway so we hope that that will continue and obviously um the then there are sort of then connections for example between us in the london office and us in um sort of our colleagues in the beijing office and then local partners so this is yeah this this kind of collaboration is sort of normal for us but what we're trying to really look at now is like how much do we actually need to 
make these kind of long distance trips for sort of directors and partners and so on how when is it really important that somebody is there in person and when is it um more important to sort of save that carbon and have that yeah like you say like local um local participants taking yeah getting getting involved kind of because that that local knowledge is also really really valuable and that, that kind of god it's such a hackneyed phrase now but that like kind of think local acts global i think it's just becoming even more kind of literal i suppose in some ways thinking about this and you know we don't yet know what it's going to be like working beyond lockdowns really and i think this it's going to be really interesting what i've been thinking about so much it's going to be so interesting to see how we kind of move to a more like hybrid model where we're sort of partly working remotely partly working across um video chats and so on and partly partly in person and that's going to be a real real challenge for everybody but we want to just make sure that we remember the ways in which we were able to adapt our working patterns now and not forget that that kind of adaptation is possible and you know it's just so important to to factor that in when we're making decisions about travel yeah, yeah. Uh, well uh, you talk about home working there and, and other um other questions have picked up on that. One, one uh, you, you, you mentioned, I think you thought about forty percent of full-time hours would be worked at home, and 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 you you did say that you were going to be looking at um, what the implications of that might be, given that some of yeah. those people will be probably kind of working in you know leaky and inefficient old buildings, whereas you've invested quite a lot in you know improving your own systems within within your offices. Yeah. Um, at, the question was, do you or will you build back your numbers into uh, about consumptions from home-based work environments? But but that presumably with uh, a couple of thousand staff would be a big piece of <laughs> a very big piece of work to try and figure out exactly what was going on there. Yeah. And I think, you know, with all of these things, it's important to sort of think about sort of at what point is the effort of measuring this to the, a kind of an extreme level of accuracy worthwhile and and i think what we want to, so we've we're thinking at the moment and we've been doing con consultations with all of the staff about sort of how much do people actually want to come into the office how much how much do they want to come in sort of post lockdown um and try to adapt you know for all sorts of reasons for kind of work-life balance and mental health and childcare and all sorts of, you know all sorts of reasons that it might be better to um, have um, sort of people working from home more of the time but then we're also thinking about ways in which we might be able to support or incentivize improvements to you know whether that's using um, green energy suppliers um, and sort of making improvements to yeah people's own working environments and trying to to understand where adjustments can be made so that we're supporting staff whether they're working from home or working from the office um, and yeah I think you know, many, many, many people in Bureau Happold are very environmentally conscious individuals as it is. We're sort of, lots of us are trying to do things. We're talking about it all the time in so many different ways. Um, so I know that a lot of people are already doing, you know, a lot, um, but it's just trying to navigate the the kind of, where the kind of duty of care lies with, with our practice um, and how we can further support our staff in, in making those decisions. And another question that also I talk, asks about working from home and is, again, it, the, 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 there's a sort of almost a relatively simple calculation about energy use in home versus the office and then the, the commuter route. But they say, how do you balance, you know, uh, achieving a reduction in carbon emissions through more home working against missed opportunities for encounter and, and, uh, and collaboration uh, that come out, come about in the office? In other words, I mean, that's a sort of... Um, a non-numeric variable that's that's quite difficult to put into that um, calculation. Yeah, and it's something that I think we're all feeling really keenly at the moment that, you know, we really miss catching up over making a coffee um, and th those kinds of chance encounters and then the collaborations and sort of potential, yeah, like new thinking that comes about because of those those sort of informal conversations and informal meetings. And, you know, over the course of lockdown, we've been trying to use you know, we have these like digit, we have virtual teas and coffees and drinks and sort of all sorts of things to try and um, as much as possible recreate some of that, I, yeah, I guess, like, like collegiate atmosphere, but it's it's really hard and we miss each other. And, you know, we just want to go, go make a coffee and, you know, have a chat. So I think there's going to need to be a balance struck mm. there. But I think the idea that that needs to, that, that that requires everybody to be working in the office full time is obviously not the case. And we can we can strike that balance by working in the office part of the time and connecting with each other by other means for the other part of the time. And um, 
can I, there's a there's a question um so I was going to ask you uh, and and then perhaps if you were able to answer it and then others uh, the others sort of rejoin us and 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 uh, address it as well because it, it relates to things that everybody's talked about but in in your global sustainability report which you showed and which is kind of prominent on your website there's a section uh, on in, uh, inclusivity equality and diversity uh, it's mm -hmm. one of the kind of chapter headings uh, which isn't sustainability in the key kind of uh, uh, energy use kilograms of carbon uh, de definition of it but obviously is kind of uh, has has large areas of overlap uh, in terms of whether you kind of come at it from a sort of justice perspective or a well-being perspective or, or, or whatever it might be is is that how you think about uh, as, a, as a company in terms of how you define your ethical position sustainability is sort of interlinked with these other concerns and uh, and, and positions that the, the business wants to adopt absolutely it's yeah i mean the these these issues are, are I think I'd go further to say that there, there's an overlap. I think, you know, these issues are one and the same and we, we can't look at, you know, social injustice without looking at environmental injustices and vice versa. It's so important that these things are connected. Um, and I mean, so many examples, you know, I mean, the, the example that I like to give is that the fact that we um, are measuring embodied carbon means that we're able to take into account the emissions that we're responsible for in terms of what we consume as opposed to just what we produce. And the knock on effects of that means that we can report our emissions on a much more sort of fair basis, whereby high consumption countries are sort of not looking lighter than high production countries, for example. And this is a massive global justice issue at the moment. And the fact that the industries, the, the construction industry is taking embodied carbon so much more seriously is a really, really positive move in terms of that kind of climate justice angle. Um, and yeah, we're we're thinking about, you know, sort of climate justice in, in more broad broad terms to do with the connection with social value and health and well-being. And these things are so, so interlinked. And yeah, we absolutely see this as part of the same kind of holistic piece of work about how we transition to a, a, a re regenerative and just environment for everyone. Can I uh, can I uh, ask if either Peter or Anna would like to add to that in terms of the way that they conce conceive of where sustainability fits or the sustainability of your own business in terms of the way that the business can conceives of itself, uh, uh, you know, broadly adopts an ethical position? Is my microphone? Yes. Yes. Um, I would just uh, wholeheartedly agree with what Maria said just now. I think the two, you know, wider social justice is intrinsically linked to sustainability in the environmental sense. And, uh... and I can add that, um, as I showed you, that um, health and well-being is very important in our projects, but of course also among our employees. So. One of the most important issue, it's easy to measure the climate impact, the environmental impact and so on, not that easy to measure the health and well-being um, in the company. But one of our uh, largest uh, challenges is the, um, the health of our uh, um, employees, like stress is a quite high issue. How can you work to decrease stress? Uh, we are at the moment actually working with a client uh, with our culture to to uh, that everyone should feel part of the company and also equality within the company and so you need to work with those issues constantly i would say because it's mm -hmm. new people coming and so on so it's it's um and that's also why i mentioned that we are owned by ourselves because the culture itself i think is very important for the way you you also work with sustainability so and you mentioned uh, measurement there and things that are hard to measure and easy to measure or possible to measure. But um, measurement obviously is, is something that you all referred to in your talks in different ways. Um, and I wonder if uh, I could come back to you about, you know, how, how you how you decided how to measure, as it were, because uh, Peter, for instance, you talked about um, uh, getting quite deep into the biodegradability of uh, 3D printing plastics, which is a kind of, you know, getting getting um, very, very detailed. But uh, and Maria was saying, well, you know, there are certain things which we wouldn't bother going to the kind of second decimal place on because we just need to get, um, you know, we need to get an overview. Uh, and so I wonder uh, whether, whether you know, you can say about you know, something about um, how you decide how much to measure and then also what uh, what tools you found. A couple of people have mentioned books or other resources about uh, where they get data from and a couple of people have um, asked questions about those, with some more detail on that. 
uh, and uh, any other kind of um, uh, networks or groups that are useful for kind of benchmarks and other other forms of other sources of information that you that are helpful to you in assessing where you are. I mean, I, if you want me to go first, I think the, the most important thing is just to start doing it. And I think you can probably reflect for too long on what to do and how to do it and what the right mechanism is. Um, I thought Maria's point uh, about technically their carbon emissions per person had gone up, but that's just through understanding it better and including more was, was absolutely um, uh, illustrative. And you've just got to start somewhere. I think there's there's sometimes a little too much anxiety around doing it perfectly and um, too much anxiety about simply starting. And also I think, and I think this is, this is across building physics, companies, individual lives. I think there's often too much emphasis on just trying to find highly sophisticated pieces of software to do the work for you. You can actually do a huge amount with an Excel sheet and a moderately reliable um, set of data and in that case we found Mike Brennan Lee's books extremely helpful and those are often our starting point and then you you delve in a little bit later um, and we, we haven't found when we started looking at GRI and then science-based targets actually we didn't need external consultants to help us and I think there is a there is the the potential for a consultancy industry to grow up around that and some of it is just measuring what roughly what you do and finding a source for how impactful that is. Anna, have you found that there are any, um, as I say, sort of ne networks of practices or uh, benchmarks, published benchmarks that you've that you've found useful in in assessing where you are and and you know learning from others? Um, well, the benchmark whether we are good or not within our company is very difficult to find. I would say so. It's it's very nice to hear you today because I got a a lot of ideas from Peter and Maria. Um, it's easy to measure. Um, the projects i would say um but of course uh, we are also um, involved in different organizations uh, to support we are also in um, uh, the fossil free sweden is uh, something that the building sector within sweden they had set up targets there are also these uh, architects declare so i think only to to discuss these issues you will help each other so um, but i wouldn't say that there are specific measures so or and, uh, Maria, you you were uh, emphasising the importance of um, science-based targets uh, as a as a kind of uh, starting point for for assessing your performance. But are there any other uh, uh, sort of measurement tools or, or ways of thinking about uh, measuring measuring yourself that have been useful to you? The the one I'd mention is that there's there's a carbon calculator um, for measuring your travel. And we have we've embedded that into you can embed it into your own like intranets. And so we've got that in our intranet now so that every time somebody's making a, a journey, you know, like a, a serious journey, you can look at the different options for getting there by train or driving or flying or whatever, you know, might the, the options might be and compare that so that we're making a, an informed decision and enc just encouraging everybody um, to use that whenever they're making um, a longer journey. Um, that's that's really handy, and I, you know, I think it's the sort of thing that, um, as as Peter was saying, I, I'd echo that you know, like sometimes a, a good Excel spreadsheet is just really really useful, um, and obviously, you know, we're a bunch of engineers, so we love those, um, and I think we've done a lot of it in that sense. But I think the the travel tool has been really helpful to sort of allow individuals to quite quickly make their own decisions and I've certainly used it for my own like holiday travel and things like that as well and it's it's quite interesting um to to see the difference sometimes it's also really handy because we then like try to use it when we're talking to clients for example about um well you know if we use timber for this project um then you're going to save the equivalent of you know x numbers of return flights to New York and things like that so that it does also help us in communicating um, the impacts of projects because ob obviously you know our practice footprint is really important and it's really important and I, I do believe that it, that the, the signal value of that is important and the way that it makes it on people's minds is really important but obviously it's our it's our projects that are where we really have the kind of the huge huge impact um, and so it's yeah it's good to maintain that kind of connection <laughs> Yeah, three three people quick as a flash have uh, have just emailed to say or questions email questions to say that that uh, travel tool that you mentioned is it a is it, what's it called is it a proprietary beer happens one or is it no no it's a free one I I can find the link um and 
um, I'll try and put it in the chat, shall I? Okay, that'd be great, thanks. And um, uh, you mentioned there um, some about you know the the, the you know uh, signals that the business is sending out, and I suppose that goes to a bigger um, question, which is in terms of your the way that um, your uh, your various firms think about sustainability and your own sustainability. Uh, what are the drivers, which might sound like a sort of silly question in the sense, well, obviously the drivers are doing the right thing, but what are the subjects that come up in conversation about um, uh, things that need to be borne in mind? Is it, you know, it's useful for recruitment, it's useful for retention, it's useful for uh, not exposing yourself to long-term liabilities um, or, or hidden costs in the future or anything? Are there, are there any other sort of subjects that come up in the, in the discussion of, uh, of this subject? Something, something that we've been increasingly talking about is, um, and I think it's Lendlease that have taken a really good stance on this, but like looking at different pathways, looking at, you know, if we, the diff different futures that we may or may not have, depending on how much mitigation we're able to do, how much adaptation we are sort of needing to do, and, and looking at the, the long term, you know, resilience of our of our business and all of the livelihoods that rely on that business in the face of these different futures. We have to shift what we do if we're going to continue to be able to operate and the industry needs to shift what it's going to be able to do. So, you know, if we just, we have to think, if we're looking medium term, longer term, we, we have to change our business. We have to change the way that we operate. Otherwise, you know, we'll be out and we don't want to be out. We want to be relevant. We want to be on the leading edge of this stuff. Um, so, you know, yes, it's absolutely it's, it's all that relevant for all those things you talk about and, and recruitment, especially like a, a lot of, you know, as you know, I said, you know, a lot of a lot of younger people are really, really um, it's, it's a really, really important part of why they might come to work for one practice over another or why they might, you know, give their energy and efforts to one practice over another. So that, that things like that are important, but thinking longer term and, you know, and as a kind of mature business, I suppose we maybe do think long term um it's 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 critical to our yeah to our survival yeah peter you mentioned uh, sort of hostages to long-term financial fortune as it were thinking about uh, you know things that aren't necessarily the day-to-day -day business of, of of the company but you know you know things that might be costs coming down the road um is that is that one of the things that you you, you know, discuss as a business um enormously because i think that's that is changing rapidly and if there's something encouraging out of say the last 18 months or so it has been the rise of esg pension funds and insurance funds and um i think T tcfd the task force for um, climate change financial disclosure has had a huge impact on the property industry and so certainly in commercial um uh, property there's a there's a big drive which is being driven by investors, and I think that, and that is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was a report in May from JLL on the value of sustainability, and that concluded even back in May. There's something like 12 million square feet of office space in central London that is occupied by people that have uh, lease events and whose leases are coming to to the end before 2030. They will be looking for net zero carbon space. They may be looking for less space. But that's, you know, even then it's it's probably 10 million square feet of office space that's been looked for that's net zero carbon. So I can only see that increasing rapidly and that's going to filter out across um, across um, all sectors, I think. So I think that it's a long term business risk if you're not uh, taking it very seriously is, is our view, um, quite aside from the moral issue that we should be taking taking it seriously. And Anna, you, you mentioned that you're an employee-owned company. Do employees feed their point of view about how the business ought to be operating into decision-making in the business? Yes, definitely. And also for us, it's so such an important um, <coughs> issue or reason that people want to work here. Our very <coughs> high sustainability profile is so attractive. So, uh, but... As I see it is, um, I mean, like architects uh, in the building sector, all of us have, have different uh, roles in bringing the sustainability questions forward. So um, for us, we are in the, in the early stages of the process. So, of course, our knowledge is so important to be in the forefront because we influence the rest of the chain. And um, as we want to make a difference, we also need to, to be... <laughs> uh, 
early adopters or or really pushing the knowledge forward so um um and as you say it's important to um to um yeah what say introduce or uh, have these um sustainability in mind in every decision we do it's yeah and, you, and going, going back to staff as, as well as the other you mentioned a couple of things where the business had taken decisions which um I mean, affect in a small or, or slightly larger way the way that people live their lives. So one was to do with the kind of food that you uh, supply, and the other was uh, the study the study tours, which I guess everybody gets to take every year. But then now they have um, uh, only one only one in three they can fly somewhere. And I just wondered whether there'd been any uh, pushback on either of those things. Whether people have sort of said, "Well, I'm you know I'm I'm fine with it, but I don't think you ought to be telling me what I should do," or uh, or whether they've been sort of broadly understood and how you communicate those things, how you sort of take people with you on those things internally, where you have a way where, you, where you're sort of changing people's terms and conditions in small ways. Well, when we introduced this uh, vegetarian food, there were, as I said, this is seven, eight years ago, then there were uh, some people, they thought, oh, why can't I have meat? And then I, <laughs> I thought that, well, you can have uh, whatever you want to have at home, but if the company is going to, to serve food for the events we want to to serve vegetarians so why not see it as a, an opportunity to try to have something else and i mean it didn't take a long time until people agree that that was a good idea and also the study tours i think just to show what impact or what uh, emissions a certain travel uh has it's uh, it has also um uh, the employees uh, have become more aware of uh, what actually every person, what change every person can um, can do. And I think that last year I heard that there were so many that um, considered taking the train for holiday during summertime instead of taking the, the plane. And I think actually the discussions internally had did make a difference. So, well, of course, not everyone agrees in everything, but after a while, if people get used to it. So I would say it's not that I, I think I'd just add to that because we've, we've been through exactly the same. We're also employee owned and we also realize a huge part of our business impact were study tours. Um, and so we've been through exactly the same process. And I think once you set out um, the impact, uh, people understand that. So I, I don't think there's been very much pushback around most of most of this at all I mean quite the opposite I think there's very active engagement and encouragement and there I think for people it's it's very good and indeed exciting if you believe that you you're working for a company that shares similar values and has a similar purpose and that purpose it's become proud, powerful. Uh, Peter you you talked about uh, being sort of slightly nervous about uh, a, a business getting too involved in dictating how uh, staff should live their lives outside work but uh and i'm sure you're not doing that but there i suppose there there's the potential for almost any measure introduced whether that's you can take two days off uh if you travel extra or you should work a number of days at home or um if you use a certain form of transport to come to work we will um subsidize it that it could be perceived to favor people who uh you know in, in terms of benefits or, 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 or you know, cash or whatever, people who are able to conform to one life over, over another. Is that something that you've felt you've had to be aware of or, or is it a small, a small issue? Um, I think it's something, yeah, we were aware of that and I said, I, there's, there's, a, there's a part of me that is uncomfortable with the idea of um, companies interfering in people's private lives. But you generally think, I generally think of that as being a negative, whereas in actual fact, by helping, that can also be a positive. So I think the benefit of helping people is more than outweighs the the potential arguable negative of companies becoming more interested in their employees' private lives. Um, yeah, there's there's obviously a degree beyond which that would be utterly unacceptable. Um, but and I sincerely hope that we're absolutely nowhere near that, and it is all voluntary, and it is simply putting in place a few measures that enable, if they so choose, our employees to be um, slightly better citizens. And, and Maria, in terms of in ter how these um, 
how these kind of uh, initiatives and and plans are internally communicated. How does that how does that uh, work within Bureau Happold um, in terms of getting people engaged with what the with what the business is doing? Yeah, I mean, this is all in consultation. We're obviously a very large company. Um, I think we're almost 2,000 people globally now. So um, there's a lot of communications um, and we do we do sort of uh, surveys um, and um, have conversations at different scales. So it's it's all very much about communicating. And also, as Peter says, you know, it's, it's about pr providing that like support and forum for conversation rather than sort of trying to dictate anything um and you know more often than not it's it's the staff pushing the company rather than the mm. other way around yeah i um, agree with that um. well so, yeah thank you for that. We, sadly we are approaching the end well i say we're approaching the end. we've just gone over it by, by a very short time but we're approaching the end of our allotted uh, session um so we we uh, we don't have time to pick up on many of the other very interesting things that arose from your presentations. But I wonder if, just to conclude, I could ask everybody in turn. Uh, you know, the, the the stories that we've heard have basically been very very positive. Uh, things are you know on the right direction. Nobody is suffering greatly from the measures that have been adopted and uh, and so on. Uh, but is there anything that uh, if it didn't come with a significant cost attached or wasn't extremely disruptive or whatever, you think you would do tomorrow uh, that would significantly uh, improve? Uh, performance is there is there something that is something that's you know, necessarily slow or, or for tomorrow that you would do right now that would make a big difference I don't know if anyone uh, has anything off the top of their head um, in, in some ways I think probably the, the the most difficult one we're facing is that potential for uh, home working and the um, the the increased footprint that comes from that and it's quite possible for us as companies technically to reduce our uh, carbon footprint quite significantly by having people working from home but in in actual fact as a society it will probably increase our carbon footprint certainly in Britain with our inefficient housing um, and I, I think that's a very difficult imponderable I don't know what we do about that at the moment but that's probably something we need to be very alive to um, and do you imagine, I suppose to, to Maria and Anna, you, you've both set targets going forward to uh, 2030 and indeed beyond 2050. Um, uh, does think, do things get more challenging to meet those targets as you get uh, closer to, uh, to net zero? Or, or do you think that the roadmap is sort of fairly, fairly clear ahead of you? Well, I would say there is still so much to do to reach um, net zero carbon. So to accelerate that work is something I'm working pretty hard on at the moment. But then beyond 2030, I think we should go for, or even now, uh, a climate positive, I mean, to reduce the emissions to below zero. Uh, so they will never end up being questions working with when it's about sustainability. So. We will never be ready. <laughs> and, and Maria, I could, could I think of one thing, which was, um, despite everything we've talked about, it's still worth reminding ourselves that the professions that we're in, the impact that we have through the buildings that we specify and design is still considerably greater than the impacts that we have as individuals or as businesses. And we, that's one thing we do need to be alive to. Yeah. And the, uh, the, um, whether the work that you're doing, as it were, to, to put your own house in order changes the way that you think about and can help other people is one of the many questions arising from today that we sadly won't get time to, yeah. uh, to get to on this occasion. But it might be that we have to come back and look at it again, because um, obviously it's a fast moving picture and, or piece and there's a, um, uh, there's a lot to talk about. But for the meantime, thank you very much uh, to our speakers. Um, thank you very much to our event partner, Shuko. Uh, and uh, thank you to our audience for your for your questions uh, and your attention. One of the questions which has been asked several times and which I haven't answered yet, but I will now is, is this going to be available later? And the answer is yes, it will be on the Architecture Today website within a couple of days. So uh, if you weren't able to watch the whole thing or if you think other people would uh, benefit from seeing it, please do pass that on. But uh, in the meantime, thank you and see you at the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.